Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for December the 18th, 2020. This is episode 37. Today, we'll be talking about driving the Ford Mustang Mach-E. Bollinger production pickup and SUV have been revealed. And Tesla halts Model S and X production for 18 days. I'm Dominic Ioni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Not joining us today is Tom Malogny, Inside EVs editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge of Tom Malogny. He's attending a first drive event of a very sweet electric vehicle, and we'll be back next week to tell us all about it. Um, we do have Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Studios YouTube channels. Uh, he also puts together the most excellent videos for the Inside EVs YouTube channel. Go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And finally, we have a very special guest today, uh, Sean Mitchell from the All Things EV YouTube channel, which we should say just hit 50,000 subscribers. So congrats to that. That's really awesome. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Thanks. So a while back, Kyle, oh, before we start, actually, the news thing. So let's let's just talk about what we've been driving this week. Uh, Kyle, I understand you have something from uh, uh, over the over the ocean, right? Something from overseas, and I'm and it's very nice and very comfortable. And it is the Volvo XC90, but it is the T8, so it's the top spec. XC90 and the way Volvo does their plug-in hybrids is they are the most premium and most expensive and fastest ones. So if you right. want the best one, you have to get the one with the plug, which is great because sometimes you get the plug-in hybrid and it's worse than the best internal combustion version. And it's like, that's kind of silly. So here yeah. what we have is a two liter uh, four cylinder engine, same as every Volvo. You know, I've driven this drivetrain in a lot, but it's turbocharged and supercharged mm -hmm. and then driving the rear wheels that's just on the front axle is a 14 and a half kilowatt hour battery pack with about a 60 kilowatt motor uh, that can drive this seven passenger giant suv fully electric around town and volvo has made a super important update to this car for 2021 you know i've drove i think three or four of these last year different models in the volvo range and when you lock it in pure mode which is its economy efficient mode and you have the battery charged up previously, uh, you would really have to think about your throttle pedal position because if you went too deep into the throttle, it would kick on the gas engine, right? You didn't, if you just wanna drive around town, you don't wanna use it. And the thing is, it has to do a cold start cycle. So it just doesn't shut off for about five minutes once it kicks on. Uh, now, thankfully with the new software on 2021 models, you can go right to the kick down switch and it will not kick on the combustion engine. So you can just drive around your foot to the floor and uh, know you're getting every ounce of EV acceleration before it kicks on that two liter. Um, I have to say it's extremely comfortable. It has massaging seats. It's $81,000. Uh, it does get the $7,500 tax credit. And but you know what? It's worth every penny. I'm sorry, the dogs are playing over here. Guys, stop playing. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so basically, it's just an unbelievably comfortable cruiser. Best sound system I've ever heard in a car. Volvos have always said this about Bowers and Wilkins. And um, it's so good, in fact, uh, we are considering it. It is shortlisted. Uh, for the vehicles to enter the fleet next year. One of the plug-in hybrid Volvos. We just love the way they drive, look. We love the ethos. And uh, I do need to tow something around. And there's no EVs that are long distance mountain towing capable at this point. So what, what's the state so, of range on that one for the battery? Yeah. yeah, well, that's what we're gonna do tomorrow. Actually, it should be a pretty nice day. We're gonna test to see the actual city range, and then we run everything through at 70 miles per hour. I won't do very much there, but it says it's like 21, 22 miles electric. Um, 16 kilowatt hours? 14. Uh, it's 14. the same as the V60 Polestar that I had a few months ago. Okay. And this is, um, I think we eked out almost 30 out of that one. And so okay. this should probably get us a little bit more than, than rated around town. That Volvos tend to just perform better. Also, I'm not exactly sure how they rate their EPA range because there's a setting that pure mode I was telling you about lets you eat deeper into the battery. Um, so I'm not sure if they test that just in the normal hybrid mode, but I've always been able to exceed EPA range in the Volvos. Okay, that's something. That's the same, that's the same engine that's in the Pulsar one? 
It is, yeah, they use the same okay. thing. It's literally the same engine in Polestar 1, yep. I know that's supercharged and, and turbocharged as well. They just copy and paste, and they're actually, it's on the same SPA chassis. They just stretch it. That's why the right. Polestar 1, while it's a fantastic car, feels no different than Timon's dad's Volvo V90 station wagon. They literally drive the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. So, hey, hey Sean, do you, are you driving anything special this week? No, nothing special this week. Well, what is today? Today's Thursday. So next week, I'll be driving a performance Model Y. I'll be in Austin visiting some family. Okay. And my my vehicle of choice is a Model Y via Turo. And nice. uh, I've, 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 this is probably, this will be the seventh or eighth Model Y that I've driven. I've, I've got a lot of experience with, with this vehicle. And I love it. I think it's Tesla's best vehicle. I'm excited. I'm excited to get back in it because it just works so well for for me. Yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be really interesting once they finish the Berlin Gigafactory, the where they're building the, the the Model Y again, but with a whole different you know the one piece casting in the front, one piece casting in the middle, and then the the uh, the middle battery. So like three main pieces, it's totally different. You know, uh, it's just completely engineered completely differently, although it looks the same. So it'll be interesting to see how that drives because you have like. So like you say, you have a lot of experience with that car. I I think that the biggest lift on this is probably internally with profit margins. It's going to be easier to produce. There's probably going to be some some upfront capital investment uh, in into changing the way that they're producing this car. But it seems to make sense that they would roll this out company wide to each vehicle that they produce. So we'll see. Seems very promising. It's good to see that they're thinking from a different angle here on on how to improve efficiencies and and uh, profit margins per vehicle. Right. Well, we'll talk about a little bit more about Tesla in a bit, but um, let's talk about some other things. So, a little while back, Kyle here, you got to drive what is uh, to many the most anticipated EV of 2020, the Ford Mustang Mach E. So with just days before the start of customer deliveries, the embargo has dropped, and now the internet is full of reviews, including yours, ours, yours mostly. <laughs> so uh, so go ahead and uh, check that out later. But for now, we have the, the actual guy who drove the car here, uh, Mr. Kyle Connor. Uh, let's talk Mach-E. Uh, we want to hear about your impressions, uh, different aspects, and maybe Sean has some questions as well. But Let's start with this, and this is what we ask. I, th I think in the title of the of the post, uh, is this a Mustang? Yeah, well, that that requires some deeper explanation, right there, doesn't it? Because <laughs> you would think traditionally a Mustang is screaming V eight, manual transmission, burnouts, and lots of crowds that you're running into. Cool. So, uh, unfortunately, the Mustang Mach E doesn't have a V eight for me because I'm a Mustang guy. I love a screaming V eight, but for an electrified Mustang. And actually, I think if you look at it this way, if you look at Mustang as a brand image all across, right. it is, they're the fast ones, they're the rowdy ones. For an electric crossover, this has that same spirit. It wants to slide around. Uh, you know, it's it's got a lot of rowdiness in there. I think Ford calls it Detroit Swagger, sure, whatever they want. Basically, what that really means is when you throw it into a corner, put your foot down, even in an all-wheel drive version, even with DSC or ESC or ESP, whatever Ford's acronym is for stability control, uh, it allows the back end to slide around and you can do full drifty drifts on on-ramps. And that is a key part of having a Mustang. You need something that's a little bit fun on the limit. It has to handle well, and it has to put a smile on your face. And I don't want to say what I really was doing in Ford's car. It was nothing major, <laughs> but you can uh, really, you know, have some fun with it. Now, just, you know, a week before I drove the Mustang mach -E, I drove the ID4, and I'm a huge right. fan of the ID4, and I'm a huge fan of the Mustang Mach-E, and right. I still have not figured out which I like more. They're so different. Really? You kind of need both. Yeah. They're, uh, they're very different. They're, yeah. Like you said, they're very different things though, right? Yeah. Totally different cars, but everyone, I mean, so many messages about, Hey, Kyle, would you go for ID4 or Mustang Mach-E or Model Y? And I'm like, I don't know. There's, they're all good. Um, I will say I would not go for Nissan Aria. And I know Dominic, you like the Aria, but that is like, in my mind, a front wheel drive base DV. It looks really ugly. Um, 
like after thinking about it, it's just not a pretty premium. I mean, it feels premium, but it doesn't have that. So in 2021, Sean's going to have to help out because he's here. We are bringing every electrified crossover in here to Colorado, and we are comparing them for like every series of challenge you can imagine range acceleration handling dynamics cargo space we're going to put them through everything it's going to take like two weeks and um it'll be a blast every one of the judges whoever's reviewing will take home a different car every night is going to be the goal so we are already working with the manufacturers to set this up and it's going to be awesome back to the mustang okay this thing rocks uh, you know, we already talked about the walk around. I'm sure everyone watching the podcast has at least seen the thumbnail come up. That video did pretty well. And it, you know, you know, it's a good looking car. You know, it's pretty practical. Um, I fit in there just fine. I fit in the back seat really well, uh, like tons of room, surprisingly. How tall are you, Kyle? Six foot one. Okay. But I, I stretched out as high as I could and I couldn't touch the ceiling, which was pretty interesting. I hear getting into the back seat is a little bit tricky because of the way the, the roof line kind of comes down in the back. That is true. Getting in, you have to duck your head around. Um, yeah, that's a good point. But uh, once you're in there, in there it's great. right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what the embargo lifted this week was on driving impressions. And everyone who drove Mustang Mach E released their video at the same time all right. up there. And I think it was all positive. And I think this is interesting because you have mainstream automotive journalists that don't necessarily understand EVs or even know how charging infrastructure works. Um, by the way, these are car experts. They totally should know everything about EVs, but 90% of them have no clue how to even plug one in. Uh, they just drive them for the length of the battery and return them back to the manufacturers with one mile of range left. This happens a lot. It's very sad. Um, but even these people were all about the Mustang. They were loving it. Right. And I thought, I think that's a really big thing for electrified transport. No yes. one, you know, maybe one or two reviews was like, look, they shouldn't have called it a Mustang, but everyone's like, this thing rocks, it rips. And, um, I, I, I'm more impressed with the overall perception of this car more so than the car itself. And the car was very impressive. Hey, hey Sean, what, what do you think about them using the Mustang as a brand for this kind of thing? It's yeah, a big move, right? I, I I love the boldness of the move. It's a big risk on Ford's part. There's a lot of history behind the the Mustang brand, right? And the people that appear to have the biggest problem with this, this is just superficial anecdotal. I haven't run a survey or anything. They appear to be the baby boomers who grew up with the must the birth of the Mustang. So for me as a millennial, I'm right on that 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 cusp of Gen X and millennial. For me, I love it. I think it's a a, a rebirth of a brand as for transitions into all electric, which is which is their stated plan. So I'm excited about the name. You know, the other thing that I I've seen people have a problem with is well, there's never been a, a four door Mustang. I think this is great. This is going to tap into a whole new market for them as is most automakers transition to SUVs. So four door electric Mustang. I love the boldness of it. It's a huge risk. I like where Ford is headed with this. I saw this vehicle about a year ago at the LA Auto Show. Was very, very impressed with it. Didn't get to drive it. They weren't allowing test drives, but I'm working on that. So I got a I got a video in the works for uh, test driving the Mach-E. But really? overall, I'm very, very optimistic about it. And I've, I've been very publicly complimentary of the vehicle. Totally agree. And this thing is, is great. Absolutely. And, um, you know, to your point about four door Mustang, you know, that maybe it's the generate the baby boomers, but if you look at any other four door crossover, that's electrified ID four model Y XC 40 recharge, Polestar two Kona Nero goes on and on. This is the most Mustang of them all. It's the best handling. It feels the best. It actually, and I said this in my review, it's more tactile than model Y. Uh, I have a huge problem with Model Y performance on track, which is the tires are really staggered, so it understeers everywhere. Um, And this does not have that problem. So I think Ford's chassis team made this into a great handling car. The problem with the Mustang uh, is two things I'm noticing that I'm not thrilled about after driving it. And again, I haven't done any official testing on this, so it's just 
you know, I'm not going to say all the real numbers until I, I get another one. I have one in California in a couple of weeks because I want to do some warm weather testing with it. Uh, efficiency and charging curve, two uh, concerns of mine at this point. And so, uh, again, I had it in a really cold 40 degree pouring rain day, uh, but I'm also, um, you know, the charging curve that I experienced was a little bit odd as well. So we'll have to play around with it. How is the software on the screen? When I when I tested that a year ago, it was extremely laggy. I'm hoping that they made some improvements on that. Yeah, it was snappy to a point. Um, at least when I first initially got in the car, it was, you know, super fast. As soon as I could touch something, boom, it happened. By the end of the day, it seemed to have slowed down a hair. Not something I would consider laggy, but like maybe I was like, does this thing need a reset? But also it was a pre-production prototype car. I spoke to the Ford engineers about this and they said, look, it's not going to make that, you know, that that should be resolved by the time the cars hit dealers. Uh, there are a few tweaks that still are coming. And that's why I don't want to say the charging curve yet. And that's why I don't want to yep. say the efficiency yet, uh, because these are two things that I haven't tested on a on a uh, real car. Now, I will say Ford was super awesome when I went to drive it. I think I mentioned on last show or two shows ago, uh, I missed the press a lot launch event thing. It was like a two hour come drive it and then go home. Uh, they gave me a car for the full day. So I did more testing than anyone really had the opportunity to. And they probably weren't optimizing the car to make sure that it had the latest charge profile in there. Cause who would expect someone to go and do a 0% to, you know, hundred percent charge on, on a press launch. It just was not probably on their radar. I thought I saw somebody uh, write it, write um, a review also mentioned the charging. And I thought, as I know you had some issues, you weren't really happy with how that went. And you, we, you know, we don't want, we don't want to talk about it too much because we want to see what, you know, if that's actually how it's going to be or what improvements they have in store, but um, they didn't have, they seemed to not have any issues. And the time they mentioned, I forget exactly what it was. It was like, it was already up pretty high, like 40 to 80% or something. It seemed to be pretty quick, like 20 or 30 minutes. It seemed like a- Yeah, but you see most people, uh, you know, the Mustang Mach-E doesn't show charging power anywhere on the screens. Right. So you're having to rely on charger delivered power from the Electrify America units or whatever DC charging you're using. And of course there's gonna be losses whenever that power enters the car. Um, and also I read some people saying that they tried it most, and I, and not to bad mouth anyone, but they just say, oh, it says 30 minutes to 80%. So that's good. But what you really need to look at is the charge curve holistically. It's where is the peak? How long is it holding? Uh, right. You know, and then where does it go? You can't do it based in time. Uh, the pack voltage on Mustang Mach-E, I believe is 380 volts nominal. It's not a very high voltage pack. So you're okay. having to dump a ton of current in there to get 150, 160 kilowatts. And I think what Ford is doing is obviously it's all heat management. They're limiting the amount of time that the car can pull maximum current, uh, given the state of charge that you plug in. When pack voltage is higher, they'll let you pull peak current longer uh, because to get 150 kilowatts, it's no longer 600 amps. It's now 400 amps, let's just say. Right. So you can get more time. But I plugged in dead. And so my peak was really limited because it was just dumping all the current in there, heating things up just to get it up. And I, I think that's a very odd approach. Uh, you look at uh, Tesla, we look at Porsche Taycan. It doesn't matter what state of charge you plug into, as long as the packs at a, you know operating normal temperature, 30 to 50 degrees Celsius, it just goes right to the peak of the curve and then it follows it down. So something that is, um, you know, maybe they're doing this for longevity. Maybe it's a good thing. I just need to play around with it more, test it some more before I give final impressions. Because it's not bad. It's great for road tripping. Honestly, if you're charger hopping, uh, driving like I do, it's really not a bad curve. Just totally depends on what you plug into with. And I only plugged in at 3%. And I want to plug in at zero. I want to plug in at 10 and then 20 and measure the curves different. So uh, Tom did a video for us showing off the plug and charge technology. That's where you can just, you pull up, you plug in and everything happens. It charges, it, the payment goes through or, or doesn't. I think it actually the Mustang Mach-E has some, has some free charging. Um, but did, did you get the chance to try that? When you the charged? car I had was not equipped with plug and charge, but Tom's oh, okay. was. Again, okay. uh, Tom's is much more, uh, I would say closer to a production car. His might even be than the one that I had. Okay, and but I guess when that does happen, though, it'll be uh, it could happen a little bit later or sooner because the the Maki has um, over the air updates. 
Oh yeah, it, every car will will have it. I'm sure the one I drove is probably equipped with it now. That's really good. It's just, I, I, yeah, love the update strategy. And it also means the charging curve can change over time, right? They're starting yeah, off right, very right. conservatively. They want to see how they do in the fleets. They want to know different temperatures. This is their first real battery electric vehicle. It's their first battery electric vehicle that has fast charging. I don't think the old Focus Electric had CCS. Someone will comment that I'm wrong. And, uh, you know, it, 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 they're probably taking a very conservative approach. That's fine. But to stay competitive, we're talking Audi e-tron with the same battery pack holds a hundred, same size battery pack holds 150 kilowatts at 80%. And it's still doing 59 kilowatts at a hundred percent because it has a huge buffer and this has a huge buffer. So I don't know right. why you're so conservative about the charging curve. It really bugs me. And it's something uh, I spoke to Ford for a long time about. Uh, and they assure me that it will be uh, better and different based on ambient temperature but uh, and battery pack temperature, as well as as we get closer to production, uh, the curves will adjust. So basically, pretend I'm not saying anything, <laughs> and I'll show you the charging curve when I drive the car in Los Angeles. Ignore everything that you just said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to be um, so I did see one review that was kind of negative, and... It's almost like you drove a different car. So I just wanted to ask you from like the driver's perspective. So you get in, did you have plenty of room? Did you like the, uh, s the screen to your right and the screen in front of you? And then the knob. Everyone's the asking me about the screen. About, yeah, about the hitting knob. my knee into the screen. Oh, yeah, that uh, too. Yeah. So Because yeah. I think Jacob from the straight pipes right. uh, must have must sit pretty close. Uh, we even commented in our video, we, we thought the screen was a really nice distance away. Now everyone sits differently and generally I sit pretty close. I like the steering wheel right here, you know, I'm full, full racing mode position in the, in the four door Mustang. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's something where I've never had an issue, uh, driving the Mustang with, with the screen there, uh, sitting in it in auto shows, driving it on the street. Um, never, never noticed it to be an issue. Now that I know that that someone had an issue, next time I get in one, I'm going to film and show you know how the leg right. room and space is. But it was fine for me. Uh, and the knob is pretty cool. The yeah, knob yeah. is the knob yeah. is interesting. I, I, I do that it was more convenient than using the steering wheel um, uh, dials. It was not more convenient. I just used the steering wheel. I think that's been the my biggest gripe about it is okay. So what's the purpose of it? Is it for the driver? Because the driver normally uses the steering wheel to control, you know, right. the volume right. and things like that. And then is it for the passenger? Well, the passenger doesn't need a physical dial because they can just tap the screen. They don't have to look at the road while driving like the driver does. So what's the point of it? Is it to sort of cross? Cross pollinate between what people are used to and this sort of new version of how people are going to interact with the vehicle. I don't know. It just feels and looks very awkward. And that was one of my complaints when I sat in the vehicle about a year ago. Interesting. Yeah. I see. I thought the knob to be a positive because I, I, I actually like visually, it looks great. You know, the screen's designed around it. I'm like, how did they get this thing to go in the middle of the screen? Right. I think it's so interesting. And I was like, the knob's great. I'm a knob fan. Uh, and Sean, you are not a knob fan. No. So we, <laughs> no. The, here's, here's the good oh. news. The, the knob just sticks onto the screen. So if you really don't like it, I think you can just pull it off. No. Really? No. How well, is yeah, it? There's no physical connection. They have little fingers, like a little material on the back of the knob. And all it's doing is it's telling the screen that you're doing this. There's no, uh, it's it's just it a, like a, slow, right? It, it's, there's no electrics in the knob. It's just you. Really? It, it just touches the screen on the back end. I don't okay. know how they attack it. I think it's glued or something. I'm not sure. But it, it felt great. I I loved it, and I th I was just kind of like, well, if you rip this thing off, the screen there's not a hole in the screen. <laughs> I need to dissect that when I get the car. I mean, yeah. right. I I give it back to Ford. It should sorry. be an accident that I should... popped off. <laughs> right, yeah. right. That's going to be a viral video right there. <laughs> Whoops! I break the Mustang Mach E. <laughs> there you go. That's great. Yeah, but but so like space wise, though, you had lots of room to move your elbows and everything. It wasn't didn't seem cramped or anything. Yeah, I, I would say the ID4 felt airier and bigger. Okay. Right, right. But the Mustang is a Mustang. Uh, yes, right. it felt more than adequate in terms of space. You know, I, I we spent eight, nine hours driving it around all day. No it issues. Was, it was significantly well made, in my opinion. I mean, it's pre production, it was a pre production vehicle. So maybe there's a little bit more time spent on making sure that all the details are taken care of. But I mean, I got into it and it felt 
more put together than a Model Y? Uh, I would agree, and I think a lot of that comes down to material choices. Um, I think you know Ford's, and it, it was a cold day, but Ford does really well uh, in the northern part of the U.S. where it's cold. So they really focused on cabin insulation. You know, in a Tesla, even a Model Three like my car, if it's cold out, you touch the door, you feel it's cold outside. Uh, this had none of that, so it's just, uh, I think, yeah, probably a little bit better built. I don't know. I have no issues with Tesla build quality personally. I've had a bunch of them, uh, never had one that had any problems. I never really bought into that rhetoric that the cars were terrible and yeah, your bumper might be out of alignment by two millimeters, but no one's walking around a parking lot with a ruler. So I, I don't know. I think this was built great. The new Model Y my parents just took delivery of uh, yesterday uh, is great. So it, I think they're all pretty good. I I'm like the materials in the Mustang too. Yeah, I would agree with you. I'm I'm a bit jaded because I get all the I get all the complaints from Denver Tesla Club. So I see right, which I just joined yesterday. Can, hey! we talk, can we talk about Colorado for a second, Dominic? Because I'm new yeah, here yeah. and Sean's the only person I know. So <laughs> what 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 do I need to know about as a new electric vehicle owner in Colorado? If you're a part of the Denver Tesla Club, we try and do a meetup once a month. Um, during the warmer months, we'll go on drives. The last meetup we had was a Zoom, but I would like to get people out and in their cars. The nice thing about, about a car club in a pandemic, if you're going on a drive, is that everyone is sort of in their own bubbles in their car. Yeah. And then if we have like a like a meal, I thought about, we haven't done this yet, and this is probably the first time that I'm speaking this out loud, but it'd be interesting to do like a little uh, a picnic you know, pop open the the trunk or the doors if it's a good weather day and right. just sort of be socially distanced, you know, talk, talking to each other from our cars. I think that would be an interesting, interesting uh, event. And how about charging infrastructure? I've noticed a ton of these uh, Colorado badge charge point units, the CPE 250s, like up in Estes Park, there's four of them in a bunch and then they built out more. Where's all this money coming from? How are they putting in the infrastructure? I think that's VW. That, that's VW funds. Um, Makes sense. Colorado got some. They've been building out infrastructure. It's not DC fast charging in most cases. So a lot of your DC fast charging is coming from Electrify America and Tesla. Those are the those are the two primary drivers of fast charging. And you know, if you've got a Tesla, you can get almost anywhere. Eh, I mean, if you're going like we, we've got a, a supercharger going in in Montrose, which is <clears throat> which is on your way to Telluride, which I've been dying to get to. But in my you know, 75 kilowatt hour Model S, uh, I'd be, I'd be, uh, you know, rolling in on fumes. But so the Southwest part of Colorado is a bit underdeveloped with Tesla fast charging, probably all fast charging, but along the major corridors, major highways in Colorado, it's, it's substantial, sufficient at least. Nice. Yeah, there's a new station going up right up I-25 out here at Fort Collins. It's four DC fast chargers. Those just got turned on this week. The four DC chargers in Estes Park are good. Um, so I took the I-3, which has like a 50-mile range on a cold day. We drove it all the way up into the mountains and back and never kicked on the little gas engine from Fort Collins. The region in the mountains is just so much fun. I mean, you're yeah, going great. up a mountain, but you're you're gaining energy back in an EV when you're coming back down the other way. And it's just so fun to know that your vehicle is sort of an energy generator in some ways. Right. It is a blast. We have to do a video to see how much energy we burn going up and how much we can recapture on the way down. We'll do that on yep. Pike Peak or something. Let's do a collab. Uh, all right. Sorry I, to I, I, derail. Okay. Actually, I just uh, read a comment about a, a Volt owner uh, going up Pike's Peak and coming back down. By the time he got to the bottom, it, it was fully recharged again. I think he had probably gone burned through his whole battery on the way up because that's quite a climb. Yeah. Well, and you know that's how we charged the Tesla that won Pike's Peak this year, right? Quite so going basically down what I did, because there was no charging on the mountain. Right. So we towed it behind the Toyota Tacoma floored <laughs> rental car. We towed it up the mountain and it regen charged. Then we set it down and it regen and every time was at 98% at the bottom. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy um so so model y to i think well, i think we have to say the model y is probably the closest thing there is to the mach e as far as uh, you know i would agree like, that's the closest sort of uh if you look at if you take the uh the extended range battery uh all-wheel drive mach e um premium and compare it to the model y which is also all-wheel drive and 
Yeah, well, it only comes with one battery, but they also have the same size wheels, 19 inch wheels, and they have the same um, zero to 60 time. I think it was 4.8 seconds. Yeah, they're, they're right on par and the GT will be on par with the Model Y performance. Okay, um, and the price is like pretty close. I think the, the Model Y is 49.990 and then the Mach-E will be 54.7 in that same all wheel drive extended range battery. Um, it's still- but Mustang gets tax credit. Right. So after the tax credit, the Mustang is a little bit cheaper at 47.2 as compared to 49.9, which is, you know, when you're paying that much money, that's like, that's no difference. That's the same thing, basically. Yeah, they're roughly the same price. They have the yeah. same specs on paper and they both look, well, actually the Model Y doesn't look that great. The, the Mustang looks pretty good, but I, it comes down to, I know it. Uh, yeah, I mean, and my parents love the look of their Y. I just think it right. looks a little bloated, but I also right. think the three is not that pretty, and I've had two of them. So I'm not the styling judge here. Uh, right. Basically, I know what you're thinking, which is which would you have, Model Y mm. or Mustang Mach-E? And I'd, I'd be interested to hear both of your uh, responses as well. But mine comes down to totally depends on the use case of the vehicle. Uh, I travel so much. I do, you know, 80, 90,000 miles a year driving across the country, uh, making videos. And, and this is sort of um, the Tesla world for me because you can do 250 kilowatt charging and you have a pretty okay charge curve, not amazing. The Mustang is the one I would rather live with every day. I mean this seriously. Uh, it's easy to get in and out of. It has great steering. It's perfect for cruising around town. We have amazing roads right out our front door. I can go, if I wanna go and have fun, I want the Mustang. Uh, and I think the Electrify America infrastructure is there. You can go cross country. A lot of people don't realize how built out it actually is yet. Um, and I'm doing a, a program to showcase this in the near future. But um, the, the Mustang can get everywhere. It's just the charging curve limits the road trip ability for the very unique use case that I have. But again, if I had to choose between the two, uh, and I wasn't driving across the country all the time, I'd go for the Mustang. Dominic, what would you go for? Um, well, I haven't driven either, so I'd really like to drive them and just to see like how the suspension feels, how the ch chassis feels. Um, I assume that the Mustang Mach-E has a bit more rear bias so when you step on it, has a bit more oversteer, which is- Much I, more. I, I tend to prefer oversteer to understeer. Uh, so just, it's, yeah, it's, as you should. <laughs> It's it's really a toss up. I, I like the way the Model E looks. I like I like the way the the Mach E. Look, I mean the Model Y and the Mach E. I like the way they both look. They're very different looking, but you know I I, I can appreciate them both. I I kind of lean more Tesla just because I know it's you know it's a good vehicle and it should be pretty reliable. I'm I'm a little worried Ford's going to have some reliability issues, being that this is their first all electric vehicle and and interesting. Uh, because, that watery uh, form and it, all you know, new cars. Well, we'll everyone's first excited. Know because you have the forum, but I, I do want to talk about reliability for a second. I think Ford has taken such a conservative approach with this car. They're not stressing the batteries. They're not stressing the motors. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is very understressed. And I use the example. Uh, Sean will will know. Remember in early X's, like a P ninety D X, when you floor it and they kind of shake up front. Like you right. can tell that was stressed. This right. is the opposite. This you floor it and it's like, oh, you can tell there's enough, like another 150, 200 horsepower they could get out. I don't think, uh, and I know I'm going out in line saying this, I don't think there will be reliability issues with the with the Mustang. I think they've really overbuilt that car. Uh, but time will tell, of course. And Tesla's right. proven. Right. Yeah. Was, uh, you, you've got a track record of Ford building cars for more than a decade, probably, or sorry, more than a century. So, you know, if I was going to put my money on which one is going to be better built and less build quality issues, I'd probably lean more towards Ford, to be honest. Right. But if then again, you look at the OEMs, they all have, you know, major, re huge recalls, you know, so things do go wrong, even, you know, when you've been doing it for a century. Um, so I'm just worried about like, you know, did they, did they, you know, spec the bushings, you know, well enough for the bearings and the suspension. There's, oh, I think you know, Ford got all that. I think I they're. So. I mean, it's all the same as everything else they built. It's, it's just a heavier vehicle than what they've been making, right? So there's, it's not quite the same thing. I mean, I just had a Ford F two fifty with a seven point something liter V eight. I right. think that's heavier than the Mustang. I don't know. Oh, I, I, 
I, I really, uh, you know, I know all the, not all of them, but I know many of the chassis engineers that worked on this project, okay. uh, you know, it, I, and they're all came from Mustang GT 500 program for GT program. They're not messing around with this thing. This right. was, I, like I said, I, and this is gut feeling and I'm not trying to argue you. I just really think this car is overbuilt. Okay. That's fine. It's a little heavier than, than the uh, Model Y as well. Sure. Which is fine. Yeah. So it should be pretty interesting. I, I still, yeah, I still lean a little Tesla just and because of range and, and I'm just familiar with it, but I really, really would like to feel like the, the suspension, how, you know, that just the whole experience and how the materials feel and, you know, yeah, it's, it's nice in there for sure. I can't wait for you to drive one. And uh, if we get one, I may have to road trip it all the way down there. Sounds and good. Uh, <laughs> Sean, so you, which would you go? Would you go Mustang or Model Y? Great question. So, I have not driven the Mach-E yet. Uh, in terms of looks and styling, I lean more towards Tesla, but you know, Tesla is my world in a lot of ways. I, I want to I want to feel how the Mustang drives, as well as uh, what is what is the performance like, and how does it feel? What suspension? So, uh, you know, in terms of styling, you know, Tesla. I, I I think I'll give Tesla that one for me and my personal preference. But I suspect that you're going to be able to tell that with the Mach-E that you're driving a vehicle made by a company, an automotive company, that just has a lot of experience producing vehicles. And there's probably going to be a lot that it's just you can tell. It's just better made. So, you know, charging infrastructure is another one. I'd love to drive the thing around and just see how it feels getting from charger to charger. Is there enough infrastructure to get around comfortably? That is probably going to be another big one for me um, because I can do that pretty easily around Denver in my Model S, which has, you know, I leave if at a 90% charge, 203 miles. And if I'm doing a ton of driving for real estate, I may need to stop and charge. So do, do I get that range anxiety with the Mach-E and their current infrastructure? That's what I want to know. Well, uh, I do want to show something. Denver, we are lucky to live here because the DC charging infrastructure is truly insane. We have, what, six superchargers or something? These are just CCS fast chargers in Denver. I mean, it is uh, oh, nice. amazing. And Electrify America has like 12 more under construction. I don't know what they're doing here, but they're putting one on every street corner. <laughs> they have uh, and a lot of it. Go ahead, Dominic. Is there an EV Go presence there? Uh, yes. Not, yeah, but it's not as much as Electrify America is right yes, now. I mean, if you look at EA, they're putting like every station here. Um, and no, it's not just because I moved here. It's no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what it is is we have these lifts in Denver that are Kia Nero Electrics, and they need to charge. And they have a deal with Electrify America where if you're a lift driver, you can rent per day an electric Kia Nero and then you get free charging on Electrify America. And That's so a it's a great, great project. Electrify America is the, the super Tesla supercharger contender. It, it is uh, and a lot of Tesla, like super fans don't realize this. They talk down to non Tesla charging infrastructure, but Electrify America is on the come up in a serious way over the last two or three years, they have grown their infrastructure exponentially and it's been really impressive i i think that you know the one the one potential problem that we may see though is that all of these automakers are choosing to do partnerships with electrify america so is that infrastructure going to be strained because you got all of yes. these automakers relying on it whereas tesla just has their own or a monopoly right now you can pretty much pull up to an ea station and know no one's going to be there Sure. But right in now. a year from now, in a right. year from now, you're right. going to be wishing you had a Tesla to go because of the traffic. And I don't see uh, yet the future That's build out capacity. Yeah, but I really think it's true, though. Right. Like right now, going across the country on Electrify America is not going to be any problem. I think in a year from now, two years from now, you're going to be how many people are there? How long is the wait? And they're going to have to build out capacity at each station massively. I hope that they add, and they may already have this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I hope that they add how many stalls are available at EA charging stations. Because they do, and it's piped into the Mustang as well, which is cool. So the Mustang will show real-time charger status. Right. Great. Right. I mean so, yeah, uh, just, to, just to 
tap this, finish this off. Um, so the Electrify America thing, it's going to be very much like the Tesla experience with with for Maki owners. You know, this is going to drive up, plug in, and you know everything just happens, right? It's any partner of Electrify America. So all the VWAG products, uh, Lucid, mm -hmm. uh, of course the Mustang, and whoever else is partnered with IEEE fifteen ninety, whatever it is, plug and charge standard will work just fine. Right. So and so one last little bit of Maki -E news before I move on. Uh, the was it the California Route, Route One uh, variant of the Maki. -E. Uh, it's going to get a three hundred and five mile EPA rate, rate, range rating. That's five miles more than the regular. Uh, what is it the premium? I believe. So yeah, the, the, the longest range of one is 300, 300 miles rear wheel drive, but the California Route 1 gets 18-inch uh, wheels instead of 19-inch wheels and aero wheel covers, which look pretty decent actually. And yeah, so it gets an extra five miles. And I don't think, I don't know if we really want to talk about that too much, but. And I think I expect for the range of the Mach-E to be true, a little bit more true to what their EPA estimates are. Yes the way that Tesla designs their vehicles is optimal for lower speeds than many other automakers and their range. Uh, Tesla consistently uh, underperforms their EPA, whereas a lot of these other automakers come in a little bit more conservative and are in some cases outperform EPA range like the Taycan. It just does better on the highway. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And it's a test. Maybe Sean, do you want to do it with me? We're going to grab a Model Y dual motor and a Mustang Mach-E. And we're not just going to both run them in our 70 mile per hour test, but we're going to run them side to side. And we're going to take turns as to who dips behind the other car when another car comes. Right. And I bet it's going to be closer than what anyone thinks. I think they will run out nearly at the same point. I like those side by side comparisons. You know, we do like, we do this, we've been doing this 70 mile an hour test on the highway, which is great. You know, go one way and then come back the other way, you know, to, to make up for any wind or elevation changes. But just I like the, the drama of the side by side, you know, challenge experience. It's going to be great. Yeah. And we're going to let them run out right on the road and pull right over to the shoulder, grab a tow truck, because uh -huh. uh, this is a real big thing. And I, I would love to experience or at least talk to someone at the EPA as to how they, you know, nothing Tesla does is illegal in the way that they rate their cars. They run no. it through a different cycle. They're just not apple to apple comparisons. Right. Uh, when you look at the cycles that the cars are run through. I think Tesla runs through a five cycle. Everyone else goes through a two cycle. Uh, it'd be amazing to go over. And uh, hopefully someone knows someone at the EPA that we can talk to. It is, just it is so complex how they test it. It is remarkable. I did it. I did a deep dive into this, probably spent 35 hours studying this and looking into this and asked, asked a few journalists who did go to the EPA testing. Uh, most, m most vehicles, automakers just submit their numbers and then the EPA reviews and verifies them, but it's quite complex. The other thing that I realized is that how the EPA tests is not how Americans drive even today. Right. So it's, it's, it's tough because a lot of people just do different driving, but a lot of people do faster driving than what the EPA tests for. And that, I think it makes it really hard, especially for EVs who are very dependent on the range at this moment because the charging infrastructure uh, is, is just not as built out as, as gasoline. Totally right. agree. It all comes down to charging infrastructure and charging curve, because if you're only trying to charge when the battery can accept max power, you're really eking out every last uh, drop to get it down to 0%. But if you have an e-tron, you can plug in at 50%, 20%, you get the same. It doesn't matter. Right on. Hey, we're, we're eating through our time uh, pretty quickly here. So I just want to run through some of the other stories we got to make sure we can hit most of them. Uh, so let's switch gears a little bit now and talk electric pickup trucks and SUVs from a low volume startup. Uh, Bollinger has revealed that the product production intent versions of its B1 and B2, their SUV and pickup respectively. Um, originally, they were unveiled in the April of 2017. The vehicles in the company have undergone a number of changes. The company companies moved from upstate New York to the Detroit area, and now they're in uh, Oak Park, Michigan. And the prototype ver vehicles themselves have also seen a number of revisions. Um, production was targeted to start 2021, but in October we, re we reported that they were looking for another $50 million to finish engineering, and then they're going to need another $250 million to start series production. So 
finding backers who believe they can sell enough vehicles for 125 grand a pop uh, is, uh, you know, and be a growing concern at that, you know, plan, it's going to be tough, I think, to find backing. So I can see them being a little delayed. Sean, what do you think of, of this slightly refreshed design? And what do you think the chances of them reaching production are? I, I, I lo I've always loved Bollinger's design. It's just this yeah. classic sort of like what I call sort of a mid-century modern style. It, it just is a, a subtle nod to a just very simplistic design in an automobile. My biggest concerns for the company are price point for the range that you get. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think I, they've done a remarkable job with, with what they have. And Robert has the founder and CEO has funded this primarily by himself, but they're going to need a lot more money. Yeah. It's capital intensive to, to get one vehicle up and running. I think that they may be a perfect contender for a reverse merger um, for reasons I won't go into today, but they're going to need more cash. And if Robert wants to keep his company, that reverse merger may be an optimal, an optimal way to do that. Right. Uh, this is a special acquisition company, and I believe actually he's already on the record of saying he doesn't really want to go that route. But there you go. Ca ca cash will drive that a lot, right? Yeah. If if they can find private investors, fantastic. But um, you know, a available access to large sums of money, billions of dollars, like what I think they're going to need. There's limited limited places that you can find that. Yeah. It's it's tough building a small startup on on your own platform and uh, Fisker, for instance, is a good example of this. Or, you know, trying to start up again, and he's you know, he did, he this he's uh, got to deal with Magna, and I uh, and he's got what's the uh, Fisker Ocean is the uh, S, the little crossover SUV they're working on. They're going to use the Magna platform, so that's going to solve so many of his problems. You know it. Um, yeah. Well, it makes sense for him because he's a designer. He just wants his right. stuff to look cool. And then take all the engineering, you know, and just just make it into something. That's the problem they had with the first Fisker Karma, right. which was beautiful car drives like garbage. Right. So you know, we'll see how it how it goes with with this new version. I've sat in the ocean; it was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so we'll we'll see how they can build it. Magna's a great company. They yes. build G wagons. They build Aston Martin uh, V8 Vantage. I they pace. build. Uh, they rate, they build the I-Pace. They designed Mercedes four-wheel drive, four Matic system. Uh, Magna Steyr is awesome. Uh, and they, I don't know if they're going to build them out of their, they have a factory in Graz, Austria, that I think is their largest facility. Right. So perhaps the ocean will be built there. Although we might have some tax uh, stuff coming up that's proposed that the car would have to have final assembly in the U.S. to qualify for a tax credit. So maybe uh, Magna would be convinced to build a facility here. We'll have to see. Yeah, so it would be nice if Bollinger could find a partner like this. But it's such a like a different vehicle, the way it's constructed, you know, compared to other vehicles. It's just like such a one of a kind, you know, unique, almost bespoke kind of thing. You know, I mean, they do have some uh, commercial vehicle ideas as well, and that could drive scale, which could help really kind of help them out. And it would be nice if something came through on that end. But yeah, a lot of growing competition in the commercial EV world, especially sure. coming this year. It's going to be really tough. I think um, we have all these startups that are just getting going in it now. And um, similar to like the early days of EVs, I think we'll, we'll be left with two or three big players. Right. And, and so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, but I can't wait to start driving big box trucks around that are electric. That'll be a blast. Yes. As a driver of big box trucks for a long time, me too, actually. Yeah. That'll be yeah. fun. So sticking with that electric pickup vibe, uh, Lordstown Motors has made some news this week. The future manufacturer of the Endurance pickup truck held a press conference in its factory that is refurbishing in Lordstown, Ohio, to announce that it is teaming with Camping World, who will offer service for the brand at over uh, at its over 170, 170 service and collision centers across the United States. Uh, they also have thousands of technicians and service bays, a 24-7 tech hotline, and a Good Sam's roadside assistance program that will come in handy. Uh, if the relationship develops nicely, it's also possible that Camping World may also offer sales of the vehicles. And 
Um, so Camping World also uh, does RVs. They sell RVs. And so they're also talking about working together on a pro on product. So next summer, we may see a prototype of a pull-behind trailer with a Lordstown battery in it. And that's just the start. They also want to eventually tackle like an actual RV on the endurance platform. So I've, I've never heard of Camping World before this announcement. <laughs> so I defer to you guys. Um, Kyle, what do you make of this deal? Uh, it's weird. Everything about Lordstown is weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> the the yes. Why you need in-hub motors, why you need Mike Pence there at your launch. Nothing makes sense to me about this entire car. And now you're going to have to go to Camping World and battle, you know, your your family, you know, your family audience trying to buy lawn chairs to put on the roof of your RV at the next NASCAR race. It doesn't seem like this makes any sense. All they really needed was a nationwide network of something where they can have one person at each store that's qualified to work on it. And I get their approach. It's the cheapest way to offer a nationwide service network. But right. like, you don't want to buy an F-150 and then have to take it to Lowe's every time you get it worked on. You want to go to the Ford dealer. So I don't know. I think it's kind of silly. What do you oh, think, Sean? The, the whole thing, the, like the whole company seems like an afterthought. It reminds me a lot of Nikola. It, it just... It's like they're trying to build a boat as they're launching the boat into the water and trying to plug the try to plug the holes as the water's coming in. And it, it, they it, may it, have it, never it, sailed before either. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It just <laughs> seems like a joke. It's it's a complete afterthought. Uh, I'm have to be proven wrong. I'll admit, right. I'll admit if I'm wrong, um, but I don't think they're going to make it. You know, I've had similar th similar feelings about them. You know, over the whole time and. But they keep on moving forward and, and managing to do, you know, achieve this and that. And it's like, man, this maybe. Well, they're maybe? not achieving anything until a car rolls off the line sure. in my book. You're you're literally nothing until something moves off the production line or you've affected another product that's moving off the production line. Yeah. And right now, I think last we heard someone went over to the factory. There was like nothing going on. I mean, again, I don't know. But um, I mean, they have a lot of there's a lot of work to do. Doesn't and, even look that good. Like if you're gonna make right. all this hubbub, make it look interesting. Right. I mean, I mean, they're reusing a lot of the old equipment. So you know, they had some of it running during the uh, the beginning of the press conference, and it's you know it's kind of dingy in there. You know, it's it's not like a it's like brand new sparkly you know EV it's not factory. Like a Lucid factory. No, or a Tesla factory, or or I don't know, or uh, BMW has great looking factories. Um, yeah. Have so we, do we have any Lucid news this week? By the way. Just not off, no, not on the list anyway. I think I, one thing I wanted to mention was sure. I saw their factory was was really coming along well. Uh, Peter Hawk Holdinger, who's head of production, who I, I personally know him, awesome guy. He was uh, basically went in there, fixed all the, the production ramp up issues with the Model 3. He's the one who built the tent that had higher quality than the regular production line. Okay. He's running uh, Lucid's plans. Uh, basically, dream come true for for Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Rawlinson runs the company. Said, just go build a factory. It's your right. project. Make it how you want it. And it's built uh, for huge expansion. They did it right, and it's a full uh, first greenfield EV factory in the country. Looks great, and it's now ready to start pumping out cars. I'm pretty excited about the whole thing. Yeah, Tes Tesla's Fremont factory was like a godsend because it, it got them off the ground. But th now that they've grown grown to this scale. You know, it's it's kind of holding them back a bit, you know, and that's why the, this Texas uh, Giga factory is going to be so important for them. Very uh, exciting. Yeah. So speaking of scale, uh, Geely has a a new platform. So we often talk about scale. It's like making a huge number of the same thing, and it's a strategy that automakers can use to reduce cost. Um, so they make a single platform and they can use them for a number of different vehicles. I think uh, Volkswagen is probably the prime example of this with its MEB platform. Uh, well, uh, now comes word that the Chinese outfit Geely is going to follow the same path. It, it's unveiled its new C platform. That's S-E-A, like the ocean, uh, which will use it will use to underpin a wide variety of different size of vehicles from subcompacts to full size and even light commercial vehicles. And it will use them in nine of its brands, that's a lot. Um, so starting in 2021 with the Link & Co Zero EV, that's a Chinese car and a Chinese brand, Link & Co, that I think looks pretty sweet. It's got some good specs too. So this is an, it can give us an idea of what we can see is possible with this new platform. Uh, this one has, well, the range is on the NEDC uh, test cycle, which is you know hugely um, 
optimistic. So they say 435 miles. Uh, like in my head, I'm just, I say 300 miles. So, you know, in that neighborhood, which is okay. Um, but zero to 60 is less than four seconds, which is great. It's an 800, 800 volt uh, battery system, uh, all wheel drive. Uh, Do we know if it's a 400, 800 volt switching or it's 800 volt nominal across the whole do pack? No. Okay. Because I, I guess um, GM has that approach with the Hummer where it will switch uh, between 400 and 800 volts series right. in parallel given the conditions that it's in. Yeah. The whole 400 volt, 800 volt uh, thing is a whole really, it's kind of inside, inside EVs, inside baseball kind of thing. But, you know, it's, it's still kind of neat how they manage to do this. Yeah, it's super important because it really affects thermals and efficiency of the system. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see their approach for charging on 400 volt architecture, because I'm pretty sure in China, a lot of those GV chargers, uh, you know, they've been around for a couple of years, but the early ones uh, do not support 800 or a thousand volt charging. They go up to 600 or so. So it'll be interesting to see if they have a booster like Tycon, like Lucid has. Right. Electric systems are all always uh, this weird dance between amperage and voltage, you know, how to make the most efficient, most, uh, I don't know, you get the work the way you want it to work for you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. We should mention that uh, I thought I made a note of this, but Geely also owns Volvo, Polestar. Um, I had a, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Lotus. Lotus. Yep. And the electric, uh, the London Electric Vehicle Company, which makes the uh, London cabs, and they have a, a van now, I think, as well, based on that. And platform. Lincoln Co. Right. They have Lincoln Co. Um, yeah, I guess I'm driving a Geely product, Geely product this week, and it's very nice, as and, all are. I have and, not driven a bad Geely product. Right. Uh, I think they own Proton as well, which is a, a mostly in Malaysia, a small. I didn't realize they had Proton. That's cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, most people don't even know. Proton really exists, but well, the thing that that they're doing, which I think is really smart, is they're taking these sort of not struggling but kind of holding on by a thread brands. Right. Like I think Aston Martin might be next to go to them, uh, although they have I think eleven percent ownership from Mercedes Benz, um, and they just say, "Here's all the money in the world. Open checkbook. Do what you want, and you have full access to everything that we've done." But don't like we're not going to design your cars. You're a European company with Volvo, for example. They said, "Look, make it as Swedish as possible. Dive into that. We're just writing the checks back here." And uh, I think it's a great approach, and it, it really helps automakers uh, go electric with existing platforms and to stick with their design targets. Right. So let's hit a couple of things really quick. Uh, I just want to mention that Jeep is launching the series production of the Wrangler 4XC plug-in hybrid. Uh, now so uh, but that's uh it's got a 17 kilowatt hour battery which in in that thing gives you 25 miles of range so not not super interesting but you know if you're you know people love jeeps and so if you love jeep and you can't sacrifice you know whatever we'll, uh, we'll be taking it off road we're gonna see how far we can go on dirt i imagine not not uh, more you, than about five miles off roading but we'll see yeah you, you're getting one i would imagine Oh yeah, for sure. And you know, my sister has the Jeep Wrangler mild hybrid now. So she has the most hybrid of the, the Wranglers that you can get. And okay. it's got a lot of torque off the line. I, okay. I have, it, it has to live up. It has to have good, you know, big expectations for this. It has to do good things in electric because even the RAV4 Prime can off-road in full electric mode. So the Jeep right. has to as well. Right. And FCA does have some experience with this, with the plug-in hybrids, with the Pacifica van, which, you know, they had some teething problems, but I think they mostly worked out. So anyway, I'm, I have pretty decent hopes for this new, new vehicle as far as like the engineering and things that are concerned. Um, so also this week, Zooks just uh, unveiled its autonomous, fully functional taxi of the future. Um, and like, most of the autonomous vehicles I've seen so far, it looks like a toaster. Um, I, I don't get it really. I'm not like, a, yeah, I'm not sure what the, what I make of all the autonomous vehicles things, I, or where they fit in the whole landscape of things, or, or if they even will fit. I think it's like a big question mark, it's, you know, because it's like I don't know, do. You want to travel with three or four strangers? Like, I mean, people do it now in Ubers and Lyft and things, but you know, but there's no driver, there's no like referee. Um, you know, I don't. I, I'd just soon see like single vehicles or, or two passenger vehicles doing the same kind of thing, especially autonomous ones. And it's a smaller footprint and things like that. But the, just to get 
get this out there that the Zoox has 133 kilowatt hour battery. It's the biggest available, I think, on the market. And uh, it should be able to go 16 hours straight on a single charge. Top speed, 75 miles an hour, which is pretty good. It's one of the smaller ones. It's like 12 feet long, and it has uh, cameras and radar and LiDAR. And yeah, and they're currently in its testing phase in Las Vegas, San Francisco, and Foster City, which is California, I believe. And I don't know if anyone wants to say anything about that. Autonomy, some people need to figure it out. That's it, right. It, sort it out but uh you know launching a vehicle when you don't have the autonomy piece figured out quite yet it seems like autonomy is a little ways away so getting hyped up over a a people mover like this uh, it's it, it doesn't get me terribly excited right right yeah, i saw the the cruise the james cruise uh, vehicle i think what they call that now but uh you know i mean it's nice enough and you know doors open and it's kind of nice but it just seemed like that one seemed like overly large. Like they're talking about saving footprints, but it's like the same size as a car or SUV, you know, it's small as shit, you know? So I think it looks cool, but that's just me. I like weird cars. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they all look like little toaster pods to me, but yeah, the toasters are good. Everyone yeah. has one. Right. Okay. Um, so but other news drives a toaster. Right. Well, that is true. <laughs> so other other news real quick uh the volkswagen id buggy and id ruggeds won't make it to production which i think is a shame i, I think it's, it's a it's like a volkswagen uh, afraid of taking the risks on something even though i think the the investment in those models would be kind of minimal since they're on the same meb platform you know they have a chance to make an like an iconic vehicle that could you know be a halo for them in some respects so like number one it's like it's like the doom buggy. No one's going to have an electric doom buggy for a while, or or off roadish kind of um, open top thing, like this peculiar kind of vehicle. And same with the rugged, like a boxy, you know, four by four kind of thing, like smallish. I, I think they just had a, a good chance to maybe make a a good statement and and grab some grab some market share. I don't know, and maybe have like a haloish kind of vehicle. But on the best. other side of that, uh, I have news from VW, an sure. unofficial conversation that the ID bus thing is moving along great. And oh, uh, we're still expecting to see that, which is going to be so rad. Can't wait. And a lot, I mean, everyone always seems excited about the bus, you know, so. Uh, they're full yeah. steam ahead with it. I think uh, they've kind of already, they're, you know, they're done with ID4 that's in production. It's all in the bus is what it right. sounds like. Okay. Well, that should be that should be pretty cool. I think that VW needs to focus on the electric vehicles that are going to have the best mass market appeal in order for people to sort of buy into, oh yeah, electric vehicles can be viable. They do work. They're selling lots of them. You're getting that sort of like herd herd um, influence. This is a good thing. And I think, you know, uh, I think a bus probably will sell well and there'll be a lot of a lot of hippies that will want to relive their their younger days. Yeah, I think a lot of the younger people like it too. I don't know. I think it's, yeah, I think it's a great thing to live in. I mean, Kyle's a millennial, right? I think. Are you? Are you yeah, to be a millennial? Yeah, I guess. I think so. And uh, I would just live in the beach with it. You know, I'd go. You know, basically, Santa Cruz will just be filled with these things. I love Santa Cruz. Uh, in every corner. Yeah, Santa Cruz is a cool town. Yeah. The the car camping thing for electric vehicles. I think there's a there will be a relatively large market for it. There's already just this hyper niche thing with, with Tesla owners doing it, but you get a larger vehicle like that where you can actually fit and move around inside of the vehicle. I think it'll be really popular and VW buses are known for that. Right. All right. So last thing, uh, Tesla has shut down its model S and X production for 18 days. Um, I guess they want to do some renovations in the factory or do they want to renovate the car? I don't know. What do you, th uh, so yeah, Sean, you probably know as much about Tesla and their plans or you have, you have some, you probably have, uh, I don't know, some idea of what, tell, let, let us hear your thoughts. Anytime they've shut down a, a, a line or lines for this long, it has been because they've been reworking the line for a new, new version of the vehicle. So, that's one thing you have experience and history there, but sales for S and X have been dwindling 
They're yes. not at the twenty five thousand a quarter, or twenty five thirty thousand a quarter like they used to. Now that was before they started producing Y and three. So the question is: Is there still a market for a higher price premium EV like the S and the X? I think so. And I think that there are a lot of well-to-do people who would be willing to pay for it if it was a refreshed vehicle. So what can we expect? Probably more range, uh, a redesigned interior. That This is maybe more of a wish list for me and not so much of uh, inside baseball here. But uh, I would love to see better, better, uh, fast charging longer range like like substantially better range than than y and three there's just too there's there's too much parity it's too close to that in terms of specs so i'd love to see something that's worth the you know twice the cost if you pay a hundred thousand dollars for a vehicle you'd like to feel like you're getting something substantially better so s and x are a little bit long in the tooth in my personal opinion i know a lot of people would disagree with me but I think it's time that they do something new with it, refresh interior and exterior as well as specs. For a premium product, I think eight years is plenty long. You know, I mean, it's classic design. It holds up really well. But man, people, you know, people love novelty. And when you're spending that kind of money, you know, it's like, ah, do you want the new thing? And so I think a lot of this, this, uh, these buyers are going to go look at the Lucid, you know, next, next year because that's... Right more it has to compete with Lucid because right now on paper, Lucid, you know, we don't drive cars on paper. Lucid's not in production yet, but right. uh, Lucid's got it. We know if they're redesigning it, it's going to be better than Lucid. I also think Lucid is still keeping things in their back pocket uh, to to have, you know, they're expecting it. Uh, I think it's exciting. We finally have the first competition to Model S. The Model S is at the weakest in the marketplace it's ever been, arguably, because Model 3 is so good. Uh, why, uh, you know, now's the right time to update it, do something that's really exciting. We haven't seen anything truly exciting roll off the line from Tesla in years. We know that the Plaid performance Model S is coming. So does right. it make for them to just redesign it, I think it would pull in a lot of people and would certainly make someone like me who probably prefers a little bit larger of a car because of kids and gear that come with kids. The Model S is 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 a better fit for that. I'm not terribly crazy about Falcon Wing doors, so that 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 sort of knocks me out for considering a Model X. But um, I see all that and I'm such a hypocrite because a few weeks ago I was like, okay, I'm going to do the Roadster. And, and so it's like, okay, yeah. Everyone can sort of make some concessions different places and, you know, a, a zero to 60 in under two seconds. And, you know, the beautiful design of the Roadster is probably my concession. <laughs> right. Sure. Right. I, I think if they make a new Model S, that's great. You know, I, I no longer have my Model 3. Alyssa's driving it. Uh, so I, I do not, I mean, I have the I3 bait and the smart car, but like, I'm sort of thinking what's next. And this might be kind of interesting if the S is really good. I thought the I3 was Alyssa's car. Well, she has a commute up to Wyoming now, 120 oh, mile okay. round trip. Yeah. So she has to take the Tesla every day and now I've lost that car. It's hers. So, right. uh, which is You're fine. I was kind of done with it anyway. I had it for a year, done everything I could time right. for something new. Right. Uh, do you have a Maki coming for you? No, you don't have a Maki coming for yourself. Uh, no, uh, we have one on order, but right. we're okay. going to follow through with it. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. I kind of want to see what the GT drives like. Because if I'm going to get one, I want to get the you know the GT. I want to shred spicy it. Spicy one? So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, real spicy one for sure. But also Lucid's looking pretty good. Don't want to spend that money. Used Tycons are coming down. Uh, yeah. you know, Maybe I wait for a used Tycon Sport Turismo wagon. That would be kind of cool. So that that's, that's the ultimate car. Yeah, green. Yeah, green Tycon wagon, brown interior, roof box on the top, and two happy dogs out the side windows. That's that's the goal. Yeah. So just just to swing back to that Tesla thing for a minute, it is eight, eighteen days though. That's not really like a long enough time to to retool a whole line, is it? I mean, if, like substantial if they're changes. The like, if they're just doing the Model S, I don't know. And the Model X. And low volume. I don't know. It doesn't seem. I, seem think, it, I think they could go lower volume, really high price, and people would still buy them. I yeah. think that might be a smarter move. Performance Model S Plaid. Yeah, Done. just make the Model S a Plaid only, and then yeah. they then they can expand the lines. Sure. 
yeah i mean yeah because they don't really i mean they're not making money they're not going to make a huge amount of money off of it anyway that's that's what the model three and model y's and the volume cars are for the cyber truck's going to be a big volume uh they need a halo model. car and right now right. the halo car is a model y which is their everyday usable car i mean the best right. like sean said the best tesla made is the model y that yeah. just cannot be the way it is that's no other automaker would let this happen i mean if you go to bmw they'd be losing their minds right now that the 7 series isn't the best right so yeah. it's a very weird concept coming from following vehicles since i was young and, and design cycles this is the first time almost in history that the entry level model is better than the top ones and there's we don't even know when when we might see that, well, I guess if if the Model S is actually being refreshed or something's happening to it in Model X, we'll see that, I guess, uh, early in the next year. Reworked battery pack, batteries from Cato Road. At oh, yeah. 4680s? Makes sense to me. Uh, new, new packs? A, a, a refresh of the battery pack and battery pack design. Are they going to re need to redo the whole thing? Redo the whole, whole uh, chassis? I don't know, but mm -hmm. it sure would be nice to get something that feels brand new, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of a Roadster-esque design, a little bit more aggressive in style, but performance, I would love to see some some new things. I'd love to see something that's that's a little bit closer to 450 miles, maybe 500 if I'm, if I'm uh, talking my wish list here, but um, Kato Road batteries, I think would be a very natural thing for them to roll that into since it will be low volume production at that flat price. Right. Totally and, agree. And Kato, when you say Kato Road, you're talking about the, uh, the little uh, battery factory they have set up close to the Fremont factory where they're producing, I forget what's, what's the term for that line. It's like a startup line or? I, I don't I don't recall. But, it's, but not, it's not like the full production thing. It's like a- Right, like, it's just a it, test line for them basically. Right, but, the, but it's still producing a fairly high volume of cells. And a- right. And yep. I believe the, the, their scrappage rate is improving on a regular basis. I, that's a big issue. When, I guess when you're when you're starting new battery cells, there's a lot of scrappage that happens. You know, it takes a while to get all everything, all the machinery, machinery, I mean, coordinated and, and calibrated properly. But the, yeah, all right. So that should be about it for the show. Anybody have anything else they want to bring up or mention? Uh, I'm super happy Sean was able to join us today. Yeah. We had uh, on the behind the scenes, a lot of stuff going on to get this show put together, but thanks for sticking in there, Sean. And thanks for joining us. Yeah. Glad to be on. I would love to do this on as often as you would have me on. This is a lot of fun. Oh, great. That's great. To, great to hear. Uh, All right. You're hired. Pick you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And it'd be great to see you guys, uh, you know, doing some collab too. I don't know. Because uh, yeah, Sean's got a great channel, and, and I, you know I've always loved his videos, and he's gotten great interviews. So uh, yeah, if you if you're on if you're watching us on YouTube, you know go check all things EV. Just put that in the uh, search field there, and Sean's channel should come up, and you can see if you haven't. I'm sure most people I think know know you already in the EV world. Mo um, most yeah, most people probably already know. But the last video that I just put up yesterday, less than 24 hours uh, interview with Sandy Monroe is doing pretty well. Uh, almost yeah. a thousand. I watched that. That was fun. I love your uh, intro with Sandy. That was yeah. hilarious. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Keep it real. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, we have been working with Sandy to try and get some videos done next time we're in Michigan, but we just haven't been able to, at least during COVID time, be able to go over there and do things. Uh, but um, seems like a cool guy, uh, yeah. super genuine, love the, the business that he has. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention before we close up the show, I know we're running a little bit late, but uh, I'm thinking, and I'd love to hear what our commenters thought, Twitter really liked the idea yesterday. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know how there's a national uh, car of the year, basically, that you have 60 independent automotive journalists that review everything. So they get 50 cars run through, you spend a week with each car, and then you meet at the end and drive everything in the same setting. And this is how you determine what the car of the year for the category is. Uh, I looked at the average age of all of these journalists yesterday, and it was unbelievably high. I don't even know how some of them are capable of driving a car. Now, I know many people on this, this board, and they're all awesome, and they'll laugh when they hear me say this, but uh, a lot of them are great people, really good car evaluations, right. but literally no one's under 60 years old. So 
I'm thinking we start not a competitor to that, but something focused on electrified transport. We get all of the EV insiders together. We do not have it tied to an organization. It won't be tied to out of spec, won't be tied to inside EVs, purely independent as a separate startup. And we all rotate through the cars. And I think starting in 2021, there'll be enough, you know, maybe 15, 20 models for us to start. And it's only going to get bigger. Um, and and uh, I think it'd be kind of interesting. The straight pipe said they were on board. Clean Technica's on board. Um, uh, regular car reviews, you know, really big names that that are going to be good at it were were willing to join. So I'd love to hear Sean if you would be willing to join. If our audience would be uh, willing to see something like this, uh, and if it would be useful, because I think we really need an independent rating agency. Done. Great. Cool. Awesome. Hey. Oh yeah. Wow. Uh, one one programming note. So next Friday is Christmas, and the Friday after that is New Year's Day. Um, we're going to have a show for you, and so you know, uh, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not going to go on vacation. We're going to record ahead of time, so it won't be recorded maybe on that Friday, maybe maybe the day, maybe a couple of days before. So next week, I think we're going to look at. We'll probably look at what Tom's driving this week or the, right now. We'll talk about that a little bit, but we want to really talk about the the cars, the electric vehicles that came out in 2020. And then on New Year's Day, we're going to look at what's coming for 2021. Basically go through, you know, look at all the models and, you know, see what, we'll see where we're at with those. And just, yeah, it's going yeah, to be I, exciting uh, here. Tom has been calling me a couple of times. So once we're off of this, I got to call him. He's probably wondering how he's going to shoot a video. I was supposed to be there, but they got 14 inches of snow. I don't even know right. how, like we don't have that much here. Uh, so anyway, uh, okay. thanks for the show, guys. Great to see both of you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, thank you all for joining us. If you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs uh, podcast post, the YouTube comment section, or on the Inside EVs forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow our, our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Kyle Connor is at Out of Spec. Uh, Sean Mitchell is at, at Sean M. Mitchell. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Uh, click, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao. Yeah.